the well U-turn happened. I've looked at why it happened also. U-turn happened also. Fault of our gurus. Fault of our gurus is not just you blame the Westerner who come and uh, uh, digested information, U-turn and run away. U-turn is also because our gurus uh, were not getting a whole lot of internal support. Now support is increased for you know some big gurus here. But in the 60s and all 50s after independence, they all had to go to the West to get uh, supporters. They all tell me, when I interviewed some of the old gurus, they said that nobody in India wanted us. We, we were independent. Everybody wanted to follow Nehru's model and become industrialized and become modern, westernized. So no one wanted to go to these traditions. So they they also gave to the westerners because there's nobody interested. Like Lakshman Ju was considered the last living Kashmir Shaivism, the living master. And he was a big guru in, in Kashmir. He died uh, some 20 years ago. And there's a man in Los Angeles, I've forgotten his name now, I've been to his house. He, he has, he was a follower of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and Maharishi and he, he would follow, a lot of Westerners would follow Maharishi and learn transcendental meditation and so on. And so they were in uh, Srinagar, and Maharishi says he has to go and learn from a very enlightened master. And he's going to take off for a couple of days to visit Lakshman Ju. So this guy thought that uh, this must be a very great man. So he said, uh, can I come along? And so he went along. And that's how he got to know Lakshman Ju. And then when Maharishi's tour team went back to US, so wherever they went, he stayed. And uh, he kept coming back every year for 10, 20 years. He stayed there. And so he made so many videos of Lakshman Ju teaching. And, his, and then when Lakshman Ju, Lakshman Ju died, there was no successor in India. So he packed everything in crates, and there were about 100 crates of all the library of Lakshman Ju, all original stuff, and he shipped it to Los Angeles. He's got a library there now. Yes. So Karan Singh told me, I'm very upset. You know, it's Kashmir territory, Kashmir treasure, this, that, and he stole it. So I said, but his point is, why did a guy like you, Maharaja, didn't do anything about it? Like, you know, he, he, he does show in his video interviews, Lakshman Jews complaining that here nobody's bothered, nobody is helping me, nobody's concerned about these things. So like, we are talking about neglect of our tradition. This has been going on, and this, is, this feeds the U-turn. Because it, it, the, the person who has knowledge wants to leave it to somebody. So Lakshman Jew wanted to leave it to somebody. So he was happy that this American has come, he's got this camera and he's videoing him and he would talk and give him whatever he could. Huh? So that was the, that it feeds the U-turn also. The other is that we're not going to attack it. We uh, put it down here with ideas that we don't think about the consumption uh, of that idea. We have made a way that even the common person can benefit from it. Yes. Where again the Westerners are in the Yes. Are taking what is intrinsically ours. Yeah, but see that that is a double, that is a issue. There is also a dilution. Uh, you 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 take something and you product make it a product which is very generic for the masses. Then you are also removing the individual individualized version and it's becoming very standardized, superficial, simple. Uh, it's a it's a good way to introduce a lot of people. I think there, there's a market for that, there's need for, genuine need for that. But what is happening is that it is replacing the deeper experience. It is the deeper experience is substituted with something similar because something simple because you can watch something on TV and learn some in one weekend you can learn to become enlightened and things like that. There are a lot of these weekend enlightenment programs. Fashionable. Weekend. Huh? Weekend. Hmm. One weekend. I think I think to introduce many people something of that sort may be needed to, to start with, but then you cannot stop that. It yeah. Like See, in our, in our tradition, because families were integrated, and this is the role of elders and grandparents, and they, you did not have husband wife working and leaving the kids for to play you know, on Nintendo and watch TV and all that. So you had a different way of raising children. And so they were raised differently. And so these kind of values could be passed on. 
but we have gotten into a mode where there's a huge population. It starts with overpopulation. When there's overpopulation, less resources, there's going to be intense competition. When there's intense competition, then the schools are producing people who can compete, get a job. So they're becoming more practical and saying, well, this, like this morning, the gentleman in charge of uh, management school was saying, uh, I, I can't justify teaching Sanskrit because the question asked will be, uh, how will he get a job? Well, uh, what is the job market of this? So it's become like that. Also, lack of respect around Indians for ideas produced by Indians on India. Yeah, Indian scholars very rarely quote Indian other Indian scholars. I am finding that I am finding that in my work. Second hand, third hand, fourth hand Westerner. Michael Dino is a nice guy, he's a friend of mine, but he's learned a lot of these things from us. The Indians would rather quote him. I know so many such things. I introduce an idea, I give talks. Some guy who's got a certain name recognition or something, he starts quoting me and all that. So somebody then writes a dissertation here. In the bibliography, they only have his work. That's what is it. So in a sense, it's also like a U-turn going on among our own people. Because there's an inferiority complex. It's an inferiority complex. Key is that. Key is that. The key is lack of self-esteem. Yeah. The lack of I mean, having this inferiority complex. Can you think of some concrete ways in which you can be systematically overcome institutionally or otherwise? See, my, I, I'm doing this in my own little way through educating people, through giving them counter examples, through showing that this is not based on the facts, this is misinformation. <coughs> there is progress, but very slow. People are. <coughs> More people are interested in the kind of things I'm saying than 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but still privately, we're still afraid to speak out. And they still like me to come and speak so that I'm speaking what they're thinking. Because they're saying, I can't say it, please say it. You know. So that is a colonized fear. People are, we are really colonized in a deep way. This is all. That's a good point. Uh, one of the terms I introduce and discuss in this being different book is Purva Paksha, we study the other. Now, when you study the other, it is very empowering. It is very empowering because I know your culture and I have studied you and I can talk to you, I can argue with you. Now, we had this tradition of Purva Paksha, which I think was, in, one of the, its effect was creating self-confidence because if you have done Purva Paksha of the other, you've done a comparative analysis of the other, you studied the other so well that you know him as well as he knows himself, and you can argue back. So once you've done the Puru Paksha, you can do the Uttar Paksha, which is response on your own terms. Then it also gives you a confidence. And we met a lot of people like one guy came from Pune, and he read this being different. Now he's able to argue with his Christian friends, and he's no longer confused, and they are confused. Because he knows so much about himself, about them, and he's shifting the debate onto our terms, karma terms, rather than Christian terms. He, since he was born, raised, his family, friends, they're all, a lot of them are Christians, and he's almost converted. But now, now he's talking in a new vocabulary, a new kind of sense of empowerment. So I would say that um, somewhere we lost the Purva Paksh tradition. When the, when we, when the People were arguing, you know, Mimamsa, Buddhism, and, uh, you know, Advaita Vedanta, Vishishta Advaita Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, all, all these different schools and our, uh, thoughts were arguing with each other. You know, this Bheda, Bheda Vedanta, and this uh, Sankhya, there's so many schools, they're all arguing with each other. They were involved in Purva Paksha, they understood each other very well. Uh, there's a Jain scholar, Hari Bhadra, 7th century or so who does a compilation of all the systems of thought from his point of view. Very interesting that this system of Purva Paksha has been around for a long time. So there was confidence. So when you came across a person from another point of view, you were not afraid of him. You, you already knew him. You know? Part of your education is you knew him. But somehow, I don't know why, I haven't understood why it happened. When the Muslims came, there was no big Purva Paksha of Islam. When the Christians came, there was no big you know, place, I would have like, I would have thought that the Shankara Mat would have said, now we have, like we were doing Purva with Buddhists, now we are to do Purva with Christianity. 
And then when the Enlightenment, when European Enlightenment and so on came, then they should have said, we now do full function on that. It turns out that China, the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, emperors, since very long time, <clears throat> for hundreds of years, have had a project to translate every major European thinker into Mandarin and teach it. So they're doing full function. So when Hegel comes along, Mandarin people have a response. You know, when the next guy comes along, they have a response. But somehow, when Indology started, as a Western European, as a European studying us, they started the Puru Paksha of us. And nobody here gave a response. Nobody here is bothered to say, okay, you, you are trying to comment this on us. They would get defensive, but there's nobody here saying, I'll give a comparison between Hegel and Friedrich Schlegel. Or I'll give a, uh, you know, I'll write a critique between Protestantism and Catholicism. Or I'll write a critique on Darwin. You know, no Hindu Buddhist response to Western thought. So if you are the target of me, me studying you all the time, and you're not studying me, then over a period of time, any time we have a debate or discussion and comparing things, it'll have to be on my terms because I know me and you also. I have a framework that can, take, that can show both of us. You have a framework that doesn't include me, you can't talk about it. So this means that the inter-civilizational discussion moved over to the Western frame of reference. Loss of language. Loss of language. As you explained in uh, non-translatable. Yeah. So, so one of the chapters is uh, called non-translatable, Sanskrit non-translatable. I have a whole chapter called that. That certain words in Sanskrit are not translatable. And I give like 20 examples, but there's lots of them. Yeah. And large part of our loss of power, loss of self-esteem, is we allowed the, the West to translate these words, replace them with English substitutes, throw out the, our word, and start using that as a substitute. Like, I've criticized the use of soul instead of Atman, and I point out why they're different. What is the difference? why we should use Atma. And I, I criticize, instead of saying Dharma Sapekshita, we say secularism. Why secularism is not the same thing? How it is different? So we've, our vocabulary has become this. Now, if you are fighting with somebody on his home turf, he'll always have an advantage. I mean, he can always tell you that you're wrong, yeah? Now, a lot of Indians feel, no, 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 that's not true. We beat them in cricket. We beat them in their own game. And then they point out that we have these Arundhati Roy and these kind of people who write English and get Pulitzer Prize and whatnot. But that is still superficial. It is still it is a popular culture, whether it is cricket or whether it is, uh, you know, writing nice, fancy fictional works and those kind of things. When it comes to a deep civilizational trade-off and a deep issue of uh, philosophy and a deep issue of uh, you know civil, civilizational identity. When the stakes are that big, our people are not able to get in and uh, get the better of them because all these uh, top post-colonial thinkers and so on, they have no knowledge of our own side. Side. They have only got knowledge of what the West has taught them about West. So social sciences, I think, one of our biggest culprits is social sciences. Uh, also, what the West has taught. Us because yeah, we read yeah. in English, yeah. we read in English, and like you explained in soul, if I approach Atman through soul, the definition of soul is already given, yeah. and I misunderstand Atman. Yeah. So this, I misunderstand our culture. Yeah. So this is the problem of social sciences, where social sciences have brought only <coughs> Western social science models. They have not brought Indian social science models. I mean, the, to them, Indian social science models have to be, dis, have to be are abusive, and so, you know, this all caste ridden and this ridden. So they make fun of it and discard it. Indian social models are a problem and a nuisance to be thrown out. Western social models are the solution to solve the problem. So obviously, we're getting shifted over to another way of life, another thing. So once we had this for 60, 65 years after independence, that's the result of that. So many generations have been raised in this kind of thinking. So the result is that our people are not able to think for themselves, not able to stand up to the other people. Every place I go to and give a talk in India, there's always some people in the faculty and some of the students who are bothered by what I'm saying. 
they are very bothered by what I am saying because they cannot handle anyone who says anything positive about our civilization. They are really bothered. They think it must be, I must be a conspirator, some guy has been sent to for political purpose to undermine all that. That's true. It's easier for me to talk about my civilization sitting in the US. It's easier. Sometimes it's very difficult to say the same thing here. And something I'm saying very ordinarily everywhere, sometimes people come to me afterwards and say, hey, you really said that, you know, you must be very courageous. People in Delhi would say like that, as if yeah. I'm, huh? as if I'm saying something wrong. My way, I can just tell you what I'm doing. My way, I'm decolonizing myself for the last 40 years. And whatever I discover, I write about. And people who read it I get some benefit. So one of the things I do in this, I call reversing the gaze. Means I'm now reversing the gaze on the West. So I'm taking ownership of certain ideas, which I'm going to defend, I'm going to explain, I'm going to show that they're, how they're different. And using these perspectives, I'm reversing the gaze of the West. And I feel very empowered. I do not have a problem. I have, I have total respect from uh, people in terms of, they may not agree with what I'm saying, but they, they know that this guy is strong and we cannot just push him around. So we need to create people like that. We need to create more young people who are like that. Yeah. Do you, you think like, you know, uh, because like all these our teachings have not been practiced for years together and, and people are not coming from that, like, you know, when they talk, they, they are not coming from the source of their own experience. You know, rather than like, you know, they are talking some like, scripture written somewhere. If it is because of their own experience, then they have a conference to defend themselves. You know? Yes, so, so, so the yoga part, the actual sadhana part is very important. The mantra part is very important. And and uh, so these are things that you cannot do without in our tradition. It is not only theory, it is not, you cannot, I have a term called embodied knowing and disembodied knowing. Disembodied knowing is knowledge which is objective, objective empiricism out there. And embodied knowing is something that is part of me. So a meditative state tells me something. Uh, that's embodied knowing, dance what I taste, what taste is like. These are all embodied knowing because they're inseparable from the person. So what you are saying is that a large part of our knowledge is embodied knowing. So the way it's transmitted from generation to generation is not that uh, one person writes a book and he's gone and uh, for thousands of years they read the book, but he transmits it to a living person. And that living person transmits it to a living person. So it goes from embodied to embodied, to embodied, like that. I think we have become westernized on a very large scale and every time I come, it's become more westernized. I don't buy this stuff that our youth is going to go back to our roots and all because their idea of Indianness is not well grounded on knowledge. I mean, it's also very arrogant. They feel that, okay, I also have an iPad and a phone, mobile, and I'm American, and I'm modern, and I'm very proud to be Indian. So the idea of Indianness is very strange, mixed up idea. A lot of cricket and Bollywood and Shah Rukh Khan is my a proud Indian kind of thing. So uh, I'm not against those guys. I'm just saying that it is not rooted in a civilizational appreciation. My way, I can just tell you what I'm doing. My way, I'm decolonizing myself for the last 40 years. And whatever I discover, I write about. And people who read it I get some benefit. So one of the things I do in this, I call reversing the gaze. Means I'm now reversing the gaze on the West. So I'm taking ownership of certain ideas, which I'm going to defend, I'm going to explain, I'm going to show that they're, how they're different. And using these perspectives, I'm reversing the gaze of the West. And I feel very empowered. I do not have a problem. I have, I have total respect from uh, people in terms of, they may not agree with what I'm saying, but they, they know that this guy is strong and we cannot just push him around. So we need to create people like that. We need to create more young people who are like that. Yeah. Do you, do you think like, you know, uh, because like all these our teachings have not been practiced for years together and, and people are not coming from that, like, you know, when they talk, they, they are not coming from the source of their own experience. So rather than like, you know, they are talking some like, scripture written somewhere, if it is because of their own experience, then they will have a conference to defend themselves. You know? Yes, so, so, so the yoga part, the actual sadhana part is very important. Exactly. The mantra part is very important. And, and uh, 
So these are things that you cannot do without in our traditions. It's not only theory. It is now you cannot. I have a term called embodied knowing and disembodied knowing. Disembodied knowing is knowledge which is objective, objective empiricism out there, and embodied knowing is something that is part of me. So a meditative state tells me something. Uh, that's embodied knowing. Dance, what I taste, what taste is like. These are all embodied knowing because they're inseparable from the person. So what you are saying is that a large part of our knowledge has, is embodied knowing. So the way it's transmitted from generation to generation is not that uh, one person writes a book and he's gone and uh, for thousands of years they read the book, but he transmits it to a living person. And that living person transmits it to a living person. So it goes from embodied to embodied, to embodied, like that. But was it broken somewhere or is still going on, but why is it not getting transmitted into the I think we have become westernized on a very large scale, and every time I come, this it's become more westernized. I don't buy this stuff that our youth is going to go back to our roots and all, because their idea of Indianness is not well grounded on knowledge. I mean, it's also very arrogant. They feel that okay, I also have an iPad and a phone, mobile, and I'm American and I'm modern and I'm very proud to be Indian. So the idea of Indianness is very strange, mixed up idea. A lot of cricket in Bollywood and Shah Rukh Khan with my a proud Indian kind of thing. So uh, I'm not against those guys. I'm just saying that it is not rooted in a civilizational appreciation. 